Welcome to the In Tune Music and Mindfulness Podcast with Richard Wolf. And my uh, incredible guest today is a friend of mine for many years, mm -hmm. a keyboard player uh, par excellence who worked with Michael Jackson and Missing Persons and Paula Abdul, etc., and so on and so forth, and who is a noted composer um, of all kinds of music, pop music, as well as what he's been known for for the last uh, many, many, many years is music to help meditate to and uh, have other psychological benefits from. And so welcome, Chuck Wild. Well, thanks, Richard. I'm really glad to be here, and, and thank you for asking me. It's good to see you. It's and, great to see you. Yeah. yeah. And um, so let's start, you know, the first question I, I want to ask is how and we're going to go back into your whole chronology and everything, but how did you get involved with meditation? Well, I, I remember it very distinctly. I was at a spotting session at ABC Television for the show Max Headroom. I was co-composer with Michael Honig, a, a German artist, recording mm -hmm. artist and composer, fine composer, we were at a spotting session, and I had a panic attack. And uh, I'd been very anxious because um, the hours were insanely bad on that show. I was working 20-hour days, seven days a week for three months. And uh, I just kept feeling tense. I didn't know what it was, but since I wasn't getting much sleep— I thought the solution was to have a double cappuccino, <laughs> a double cappuccino every hour. And uh, I got more and more and more tense. And finally, at this spotting session, I couldn't catch my breath. And the producer, his name was Peter Wagg, and, and the developer of Max Headroom, actually, an English fellow, very, very nice guy, he thought I was having a heart attack. And he threw me in his Porsche. He had a brand new Porsche. And we literally, he drove down Fountain Avenue at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> if I wasn't already anxious, I was. And we stopped in an urgent clinic. It was the first place we could find, urgent care clinic. And they rushed me in to see the doctor. The doctor examined me. And within a couple of minutes, he said, Chuck, you're having what's called an anxiety attack. And I said, a what? He said, an anxiety attack. He said, there's nothing wrong with your heart yep. except that it's beating fastly and you're hyperventilating and you're sweating and you're very nervous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I said, wow. And as time went on, he did some more tests. And, and when I got ready to leave, you know, he said, well, there's two things you can do. He held up a bottle of, of Xanax in one hand and in the other hand, he held up a sheet of paper, and the doctor said to me, medication or meditation, they are only one letter apart, and it's really your choice. He said, here's a prescription for the medication, and I think he gave me some samples, and here's the piece of paper. That's so great. He said, there you go. That's so great. And Amazing. That, That's, I love and, it. And the, the meditation instructions are still the meditation I do today. How many years later, 30 years later, I'm doing the exact same one, which is you breathe in, you count the number of one, you breathe out. You breathe in, you count the number two, you breathe out. Right. And you don't have to count out loud. In my case, I just envision the numbers. And I've looked into med meditation, I tried the medication for 48 hours. I could not take it. And then I started meditating. Great. That's great. What a great story. And and I will say the reason I kept meditating is I was so out of my mind and they wouldn't let me work on the show anymore. I think it got canceled a week later or something anyway. And uh, that I would meditate for two hours at a time. I've never done it since. But it was the only time the anxiety would go away. And I went, how is that? I'm just sitting here counting for two hours. Mm -hmm. 
And all of a sudden, the back of my head gets calm and I stop vibrating. You know, that's what I felt like. It's an amazing story and very similar to my story. Hmm. Because I also had a panic. I also transitioned from being in records into TV, thinking that would be less stressful. (laughs) (laughs) Where it was far more stressful than being a producer Hmm. of records. And I also had a panic attack and was rushed to the ER. Mm. and uh, was sitting there, you know, with my heart pounding on the inside of my chest, doing its homage to Muhammad Ali, Mm. and trying to box its way out and see the world, you know? And you're sitting in the ER, and you're going, I'm going to die here. My heart's just beating the hell out of me. And uh, eventually, they take me in. They said, no, you don't have a heart attack. Your heart is fine. Now, in my case, they didn't tell me it was a panic attack. I figured that out later. Mm. And so I went to see a therapist, and the therapist said, very similar to what your uh, Mm -hmm. producer, or your doctor said, he prescribed 10 minutes of meditation in the morning and 10 minutes at night. Mm. And that that got me back. I had started when I was a teenager to meditate and then stopped, and this just got me back on the road. And I started to see a lot of similarities between music and meditation. So you use counting, and Mm. us musicians... That's what we do, right? When we play music, we we count. Mm -hmm. So for us, I think, as a at least as a starting method, counting is a great method, and there's all kinds of ways you can count. Sounds like you're doing it very simply. You're just going one. How how much do you count? One to ten, or Uh, it depends. I count up to ten, and then back down sometimes. Just anything to keep my mind centered. Sometimes I will say a mantra, not any particular mantra, just one I find on the internet. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I I have nothing against the various, uh, you know, instructional uh, courses of meditation, everything. I think anything that encourages people to meditate is a wonderful thing. Some days I will say I don't even count numbers. I just get really lucky and my mind just... I see nothing. Mm-hmm. I'm in nothingness. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's that's truly being in the moment, which is mindfulness, mm-hmm. you know, nothingness. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an amazing thing. And it gives me the gift. Oh, my gosh. The gift, Richard, is perspective. Right. It helps right. me to put things in perspective right. because an anxiety attack is a couple of chemicals that aren't quite right in my brain at the time. A little too much adrenaline, the interplay of cortisol and adrenaline, epinephrine, another word for adrenaline. It's coming out, and it may be coming out because I'm exaggerating. My response to something is exaggerated. So to have the perspective of knowing what the rational thought is, Uh, I wanted to share one other thing that I've used ever since I discovered it. And it kind of, you know, you hear a lot of people saying that anxiety and depression go hand in hand. Right. And um, in my case, uh, I lost 60 friends to AIDS, more than 60, really. I I had to stop counting at some point. All these friends uh, passed away, and I was unable to grieve. So I never felt depressed. I only felt anxious. But as I started working with a counselor, a therapist, after about three or four years, I was able to grieve. And I realized that sadness and depression kind of feel the same. Depression is more a hopelessness, and a a grief and sadness are just a normal response to an abnormal situation. You know, so many people right. dying. Um, so uh, just a lot of lessons. But what I wanted to share was cognitive therapy and uh, a book called Feeling Good. And I don't any get any percentage. The book has been around for many years. It was a bestseller, I believe, in the late 70s. Who wrote it? And it was written by David Burns, a doctor. And it's about the the work of Aaron Beck, who is now 97 years old. Mm -hmm. And in the 1930s and 40s, he was treating 
a lot of people with depression and anxiety. And he found that every single case, every case that he ever treated had one of the 10 cognitive distortions um, that he identified. Things like exaggeration, magnification, uh, either or thinking, black and white thinking, thinking mm -hmm. this happened, so that must happen. That's right. called fortune telling. Right. These are all the cognitive distortions. And to this day, I use that to, you know, I'd rather brainwash myself mm -hmm. into how to think rationally. Mm -hmm. And I, to this day, I use the three column work. You write down in, in the left column what the automatic thought is. It's like, I'm never going to get finished with this piece of music and the network courier is standing outside the door and, and it's going to be the end of my career. Right. You write down the thought in one column, then you identify which cognitive distortion it is. And in this case, that would be uh, fortune telling. It would be either or thinking, black and white thinking. It would be a magnification, exaggeration. And then over in the third column on the right, you write down a rational response. The producer of the show may not like me for <laughs> missing this deadline yeah. and causing his show to be, yeah. you know, to arrive late at the network. Uh, but, you know, they'll just have to play a rerun. <laughs> Easy for me to say, right? But, you know, so that's great. That's, that's very, that's what it all led to for me. That's a very scientific approach to a very, to a very simple way of looking at it, too, which is that we all tell each other and ourselves, we tell ourselves mainly stories all the time. Mm -hmm. We have a narrator that's constantly narrating in our minds. And what, what mindfulness does is it makes you aware of that narrator and the story that you're telling yourself mm. and realize, hey, this is just a story because we love stories. Right. We always want to be hearing stories. And mindfulness, when you're aware of the process, it's less toxic. It's less potent. You say, okay, I know what's happening. I'm just telling a story. Mm. So what you've enumerated here, you're calling it cognitive conf uh, distortions. Cognitive. Yeah, that's distortions. a that's a scientific term for basically the same right. idea. You have a certain amount of discipline and a scientific. You have a very artistic mind, but you're also very scientific, so you can combine those two. So I I want to get dive back into the the music business. Mm -hmm. You you've been a musician your whole life. Mm -hmm. And you talked about your TV, but before you were doing TV, you were doing all this other great stuff, mm. making records. So you were a keyboard player. Uh, you played. Tell us about uh, Michael Jackson a little bit. Well, let's see. Um, I started working for Michael. I kind of need to go back a little earlier. Go ahead. About how I got that gig. Yeah. Um, I was in a group called Missing Persons. And I came to Los Angeles in 1979, and I didn't know exactly what to do except that I wanted to be in a famous group, you know? That's what you think uh, when you're younger. <laughs> and I just thought uh, the only way for me to do that is for me to audition to a lot of groups. So I joined the Musicians Contact Service, and I auditioned literally for 125 groups but I told them all no. Everybody wanted me because I had keyboards. Uh -huh. <laughs> and keyboards were very expensive back then. I had spent 200000 I borrowed money, every penny I ever earned. I worked day jobs, everything to be able to buy these, these keyboards. Anyway, when I went to the missing persons audition, which was actually my 125th, and Ken Scott was there who had worked on the Beatles White Album and all these people had pay played with Frank Zappa. And I, I went to the audition. As soon as I heard their songs, I knew I wanted to be in the band. And uh, But unfortunately, I didn't make the audition because I had never played left-hand bass with the mini Moog. You know, I had it over in the right when uh -huh. I started the audition. Terry yeah. Bozio walked over and moved the mini Moog <laughs> to the left. And he said, use that uh -huh. and play bass. They didn't have a bass did, player? They didn't have a bass player uh -huh. until the third year. Okay. And so I didn't, I failed the audition, but the group was so wonderful. It was my birthday and they took me out to dinner 
in West LA near the place. So I always remembered that. I went home, got up at five o'clock every morning for two weeks and learned every song perfectly, playing the bass in my left hand right. and the, and the right. keyboard parts in my right. right hand. I went back, I got the gig. We had some albums, had some success for four years. Bruce Swedean produced the last album that I played on. Right. And Bruce had He's done- a famous, Bruce Swedean is a famous- Five-time Grammy-winning engineer. Engineer producer, and, and producer and mixer, right? Quincy Jones for right. 40 years as wow. his engineer. Wow. And then started working for Michael. Right. So- Oh, so that, that was your connection? That's my connection I to see. Michael. Okay, cool. And it, it's interesting how that played out because uh, when um, after Thriller had all that success and Bruce engineered that, in 1988, uh, Bruce started calling me. He'd call me every now and then say, hey, Chuck, what are you doing? And uh, I said, well, I'm signed to Lorimar, insanely busy, but life okay. is good. And he'd say, well, great. I'll talk to you later. Hope you're doing well. You know, I'd always ask him what he's doing. He'd say, I'm working with the glove. And then- uh, The 19, glove meaning Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson right. used to wear like a glove, right. the uh, jewel glove. Right. Then uh, 1990, his assistant, Matt Forger, called me again. And then around 1993, when I was starting to have some healing and more mindfulness- I realized that when Bruce was calling me, he was trying to see if I was interested in working with him without really saying it. Mm -hmm. And he called me in late 93, I think it was. And he said, hey, Chuck, how you doing? And I said, I'm working with you, Bruce. How are you? <laughs> and he said, great. He said, I want you to make sounds for Michael. And uh -huh. that's how it happened. I had the presence of mind through... Uh, Meditation, I would guess, and, and therapy and making changes in my life. Right. You know, all those things that meditation helps you do. So that was five years from the time Sweetie was calling you, how you doing, to the time yeah, you actually... Exactly. Wow. So that shows patience and perseverance. On his part, yes. <laughs> on his part. And your part, too. And I guess on my part, too, because yeah. I didn't realize. I thought he was just kind of checking in, and we'd see each other over at the Television Academy every now and then, going right. to the film group and stuff like that. So, so patience and perseverance are part yeah. of being a musician, right? Yes. And that's part of that practice, and you it's part that. of the mindfulness practice, I meditation practice. I learned that from practice. practicing. When I was four years old, I was diagnosed with something called Perthes hip, which meant that my hip was not developing correctly. My parents noticed I kept falling down when I was walking. I never even remember that. But they took me to a doctor who did some x-rays, and they said, Chucky, <laughs> that was my name and back then, and they said, Chucky, you need to stay off your feet for two years. And I, I thought, wow, that's... Doesn't sound like much fun. But my mom said, um, we're going to have someone come in and like take care of you and take, take you places and things. So it won't be too bad. We don't have to do anything. You just can't walk for two years. And so they hired a beautiful lady named Edna Amos. And Edna taught me to play piano. And she always told me, you have to practice every day, Chucky. She would carry me down to the piano bench and every day. And after a year, I was healing so well because I literally had never put any weight on it. They let me have a brace. So uh, Edna said, you have to practice every day. And so even when I got the brace... I started practicing every day and the musician learns discipline. And then I started taking piano lessons and I loved it. So that's so key for us musicians that we learn how to practice when we start playing an instrument. Even those musicians that, that abandon the guitar, abandon their mm -hmm. instruments down the line, well, when they're starting, you practice. And that is the key to progress in mindfulness, meditation, and music. That's the key. And for me, that was the revelation. When I, after decades and decades of not being able to meditate, I said, wait a second, 
I need confidence in practice. And you had you talked about practicing, you know, for two weeks to get the the parts that you needed to prove you could mm-hmm. do it. And patience and perseverance, those are all qualities that musicians already have that they can call upon in these other practices of yep. mindfulness and meditation. And you feel that and you've demonstrated that just by telling your story. Absolutely. And you know, I think a lot of times working on Music is meditation. Um, what was the guy's name? Last name Campbell. Um, oh gosh, he was very famous. But he used to say, "Your life." Joseph sh- Campbell. Joseph Campbell. Yeah. Thank you. What Joseph Campbell used to ma- uh, say is, "Make your life a meditation." And he used to say, "What he meant by that was to be in the moment, to be in the moment, to know, you know." where you are and what you are and who you are, and then to let go of it all. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's an interesting kind. Well, my point being about music and meditation is that meditation to me has two parts, concentration and insight or mindfulness. And in music, you do involve the concentration. You're concentrated. But the mindfulness part isn't there because you're totally enthralled and raptured by the sounds that you're making or listening to. And in mindfulness, you need silence. You need space. And you need silence. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's, that's the next step. Uh, how do you feel about it? How do you feel about the connection between music and meditation? Well, it's very interesting. I looked at music as a tool to help me meditate yeah. to begin with. Yeah. I will be totally honest with you. I do not meditate to music now most of the time. Sometimes I do. If I'm, you know, things happen in life and if I'm really spinning out, <laughs> as they say, or, uh, you know, having a tough time, I find that, that playing my music in the background around the house is very helpful. And when I was having panic attacks in the, um, 1987 was when they started. In the, in January of 1988, a good friend of mine, Jeff Kingfisher, who's a recording artist, suggested that I go to see his counselor. And I think she was doing something called rebirthing. And that did It didn't particularly resonate with me, but she said, Chuck, you're a composer. Why don't you compose music that represents the way you'd like to feel? And that led me to recording the first piece in 1988 or late 87, I can't remember which, uh, called Zero Degrees Zero. And I named it that way because that's what I felt like. I felt like it was at the zero point of my life. Right. And uh, having, you know, anxiety and panic is just, gosh, was really, really rough to manage. And uh, I did this music and I let it run. I did a 30-minute cassette of it and I let it run 24 hours a day. I made other cassettes. Uh, I bought two or three. I'd made quite a bit of money doing Max Headroom, every penny of which I spent on doctors (laughs) other than making hundreds of CDs and taking them out to the hospices and the cancer clinics and the AIDS wards and things. There were AIDS wards in hospitals. I remember going to uh, USC General Hospital, Los Angeles General Hospital downtown to visit friends and taking them uh, sometimes cassette players if they didn't, you know, as cassettes back then. No MP3s. Right. And interestingly, throughout the years, I have had people uh, tell me over and over that they play Liquid Mind in the background, um, you know, in the background around their homes. Uh, people who are undergoing cancer treatment and just to have this level of anxiety and, and a question about whether they're going to survive, you know, really big stuff. And and sometimes it brings me to tears, I will say. Um, I've had thousands of, of emails and for all different kinds of healthcare 
issues and from healthcare practitioners. Uh, it's really unbelievable. Um, yeah, you got an me. award from the pre- the American, uh, music American Music Therapy, therapy. That's amazing. I, I got the President's That's Award. That's amazing. That was for two things. One, one of them, uh, when I um, I started Liquid Mind in, in early 1988, I think, uh, but I didn't actually put it out commercially until 1994, and I was trying to figure out how to promote it. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, I'd already sent it out to 40 labels, and every single one said, be- because I was working for Michael Jackson, they said, yeah, we can't wait to hear it. Let's let's listen. And they all came back and said, well, if you could add drums and a ele- <laughs> little electric yeah. guitar, or at the very least, acoustic guitar. And I said, you don't get it. <laughs> That's not, you know, that I didn't say you don't get it, but I was, you know, I just said this is healing music and I'm not going to change it. So in 1996, I found out that there were things called music, people, not things, called music therapists. Right. And I learned that music therapists, most of them have to have master's degrees. They work with doctors in hospitals. There are a lot of faux music therapists that say that they use music therapy. But they're a real music therapist works with doctors. Right. And they, they visit people in hospitals, and it's a wonderful thing. So I got a mailing list and saved up some money and sent out like 2,000 uh, Liquid Mind CDs to music therapists. And um, about 10 years later, I had become friends with quite a few, including one named Barb Else, who's the the senior associate, I can't remember her exact title, at the AMTA uh, for for research and so forth. And uh, she uh, introduced me to the president of the AMTA at the time, uh, who was from Topeka, Kansas, near where my parents lived. Right. Her name was Alicia Clare. And because I was back there from 1998 to 2008, Alicia and I would get together. She was a professor at the University of Kansas, professor of music therapy. And she told me about something called gate training music. And this has nothing to do with Liquid Mind, really, but it's part of the reason I got the award. I'm coming to that, uh, or the recognition. Um, Gate training music has been widely researched as helping people who have strokes, paralysis, or Parkinson's disease. It helps them learn how to walk and how to regain functionality. Um, What kind of music is it? It is any kind of music with a beat that has a click on top of it. You have to have the click because there's something in the frontal cortex of your brain that involuntarily moves to it. There's uh, a couple Mm -hmm. of neuroscientists, Mm -hmm. Ani Patel and John Everson, who have a parrot who you turn on a drum beat, no matter what the tempo, and the parrot will involuntarily (laughs) tap its foot to the beat of the music. So it's quarter and, note beat? Is that what yes. you, the, the music yes. has to have a quarter and, note and the click? the gate training music, you start out around 40 beats per minute because people, you know, that have had a stroke really have difficulty moving. So uh, they may not be able to walk, but they will involuntarily start moving if they hear this click that's been overdubbed over a very slow version of a piece. So I made, I, I can't remember how many, I think, you do it at eight different tempos from 40 beats a minute up to 108. So the music therapist can use this to wow. progressively help people to walk more quickly. And so I did, I think, four or five pieces. Just, I think one of them was chopsticks, you know, and it started out very slow. Mm-hmm. Dun, 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 dun. But by the end, uh, I did eight versions of it. And the eighth version was. Dun, 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 dun. Wow. <laughs> And um, and it works. That, and it works. Wow. And it's it's well proven. And music therapists use gate training music. So that was part of it. The liquid mind, which is called the music therapists call it sedative music. And people who have difficulty sleeping or someone who's very anxious, uh, 
they prescribe my music. And there's a concept called patient preferred music in music therapy, which means that literally any music can be music therapy. My music, the liquid mind music, is prescribed as sedative. So it's called sedative music. Uh, music with a beat would be called stimulative music. So, uh, so, so, so you're writing music, or you, for the most part, you were writing music to calm people down absolutely. and enable them to sleep. So if your music is successful, they won't be hearing it; they'll be sleeping. Really, at the end, <laughs> by the end of the CD, they'll be sleeping. Well, almost. There's a, a little caveat to that. And I would do a quick advertisement that at liquidmindmusic.com is a button on the home page you can click for slip, sleep tips, <laughs> not slip. There's a button you can click on the home page for sleep tips. And a part of that is based on the research of the father of sleep medicine, William Dement, D-E-M-E-N-T. And uh, Dr. Dement, uh, founded uh, the American Academy of Sleep Music. He founded the very famous uh, Stanford Sleep Music or Sleep Program. It's not only, you know, not about music only. And he was one of the discoverers of um, what's it called? RMA sleep? Uh huh. Uh, Rapid eye movement? Uh, yes, uh, REM sleep. REM, sorry. Yeah. And uh, someone from the label I was signed to, Real Music, someone from Real Music sent him a copy of the album, and he got back in touch, the copy of my Sleep album, the eighth, eighth album. There, there are 15 albums right now, but the eighth one was called Sleep. And he made a comment. He said, I'd like to publicly say that I think this music would be very helpful for pre-sleep. Uh, he doesn't think that no sleeping to music is necessarily that good, although research has yeah. subs, subs, subsequently changed that. But uh, he said for pre-sleep, sure. and he suggests that you listen for 15 to 30 minutes before you go to bed, and then just turn it off. Listen very quietly. Uh, there is recent uh, sleep music research that I had nothing to do with, um, showing that that both in youth and in people with uh, um, Alzheimer, that memory is improved. Took you a while listening. to remember that. Right. Uh oh, <laughs> uh, cognitive dementia. You know, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, that uh, memory is improved in people that listen to music right. while they sleep. So, oh, while you're sleeping. Yes, while you're sleeping. Very surprising to me because I don't think I could do that, uh, but a lot of people do. So subconsciously you're listening. Yeah, and I hear from a lot of people that that do that all the time, and they, they think it's a wonderful thing. And wow. I, but I never tell them. I always tell people, please do not drive when you're listening. Um, I, I've made a Facebook friend who was a trucker who was in a head-on collision, it had nothing to do with music, but he was uh, in bed on his back. His name is Mike Hawkins. It's a wonderful video producer, Cool Breeze Studio, I think. Oh gosh, I may have the wrong name, but uh, he lives in South Carolina, I think. And um, Mike shared with me that for a year, he was pretty much in bed recovering from multiple uh, fractures all over his body. Right. And he listened to my music every day, all of the time, and and says that it, you know, it kept him sane and relaxed and and encouraged everything. And I have a picture by him in my living room to remind me that it, the music is not just for myself. Yeah. It's, you know, <clears throat> it's difficult. It's tedious to record. It takes me six to eight months. I fall asleep. My I was going to ask you works about that. On it. I fall asleep. Yeah. I don't do caffeine. I stopped caffeine yeah. clearly back, back in 1987. Yeah. Yeah. So you also send your CDs out to politicians. Oh my gosh. I did. I did. Uh, the most recent CD is called um, 
Liquid Mind 12. The reason there are 15 is because there are three compilations. But the most recent one is Liquid Mind 12 Peace. And just noticing what was going on in the world, um, so much conflict within the United States, so much conflict uh, between the United States and other countries and between people within countries. And uh, I just thought, wow, I need to do something about conflict. And I, I didn't want the album to be called Conflict, although I thought about calling it Conflict Resolution. Um, but I ended up calling it Peace. And uh, the topic and the theme of it is Conflict Resolution. And anytime I talk about the album, I talk about Conflict Resolution. The, you know, Martin Luther King saying that um, none of us is born hating another person. And I read uh, his Nobel Prize winning, you know, when he received the Nobel Prize on behalf of on behalf of the civil rights movement. Right. He refused it for himself, and then he said, "And I refuse to think this and that." You know that that racism is is what we'll always have to have. He was a very optimistic guy, very realistic, but very optimistic. And I read a lot of his readings. And then I decided, I came up with the concept of that every title on the album should be a step in conflict resolution. Um, and you, I, send, uh, you send it out right. to who? I, I thought, who am I going to send this to? And um, I thought, every member of the United States Congress, so I sent it to 435 members of the House of Representatives, um, a CD in CD a form. A CD uh -huh. in CD form. When was this? I did. I did this in January of 2018, oh, about a year ago. Just a year ago, okay. Yeah. Yeah, January. The album came out in January. I sent the CDs out. Uh, I sent it to all 100 st senators, yeah. all 50 governors, plus the territories, I think 52 people, the nine Supreme Court justices, the president, the vice president, and... Um, Interestingly, I didn't hear back from one member of Congress or the executive branch. I did hear back from almost all of the Supreme Court justices who were some of them. Uh, I can't remember which one. Uh, I don't have all the letters in front of me. But uh, he said, you know, I, I lis I'm listening to your music all weekend. Thank you. This is a new no part kidding. of my life. And I'm like, no kidding. oh my God, that's a Supreme Court justice, like listening to my music. And I heard back from about 15 state governors. And some of them were just, you know, boilerplate. Right. But some of them were people handwritten notes and stuff. And I'm like, wow, there's some people who are actually out there paying right. attention. Right. It was like encouraging to me. I also always send out albums, uh, I send out thousands of albums. Real Music sells them to me at cost. And uh, whatever I'm making in streaming income, I, I apply a portion of that towards just sending out as many CDs as I can. Even if people don't have CD players, they'll be curious and they'll go to, you know, to Pandora or to Amazon Music or Apple Music or Spotify or someplace. And, and, uh, and I always send out a letter with it. And who are you sending these CDs to? Um, prisons, uh -huh. uh, drug rehab programs, uh, okay. um, veterinary hospitals. This time, I think 200, 300 veterinary hospitals. And you're doing this just as a service to humanity, basically. Just, yeah, and animal, whatever. I suppose so. Animal yeah. exists. I, I guess you it's could just, say that. I, I don't know. I just do it because it feels like the right thing to do. Uh, and- you know, the steps in conflict resolution, I also talk about that in the letter when I send it out. I didn't to the veterinary hospitals, but to everyone else, I talk about the the importance of communication and respectful communication. And the, the first uh, title is called At the Center is Love. We're going to interrupt this podcast to give you a heads up that we're going to be playing the song At the Center of Love as a kind of a soundtrack as Chuck talks about it. It's called At the Center is Love. And that's because At the Center is Love is 
You know, love is something every human being in the world has in common. I don't care what their politics are, what their religion are, I don't care. Everyone has the ability to love. And so I had to say at the center of love, and then the steps are about you know, this is possible one-on-one. -on -one. It may never be possible that the Republicans and Democrats or the, the whatever-crats right. are going to talk to each other and agree on things. But two individuals that might have completely different views, those two individuals can talk. And right. they can be mindful in the moment. And they can have nice, quiet, beautiful communication and and. Find out if they have anything in common. And that's something that, that meditation does did for me. Because I used to think these people that don't don't agree with mm -hmm. who I am, mm -hmm. some people who would wish me dead for being gay, uh, I don't have much in common with them. But then I realized, you know, meditating for years really, that uh, I have a lot in common with them. Right. I have love, love of family, love of friends, love of life. And, and that's the gift of meditation. Right. There's so, so many gifts. To see the interconnected, cool. yes, there's so many, to it's endless. The, yeah. To see the interconnectedness of everybody right. and everything that exists. It's, there's and no real separation. Exactly. You mentioned either or as being a fallacy. Or mm -hmm. People are always framing something in terms of, oh, either it's this way or that way, but it could be both, right? It could be yes. both at the same time. Right, um, exactly. Yeah, that's, uh, and meditation helps you see all that. And, and just the, uh, you know, w within the context of meditation, I, I mentioned that sometimes I count, I would say most times, but mm. other times I get into this space where I just, there's just nothingness. But that to me is the interconnectedness. You know, that's, that's the moment when I go, you know, I just have realizations. I call right. it perspective. Right. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. It is. And it changes your life. Absolutely. And it changes because it changes the way you see everything and everybody. And thank goodness for being, for my parents paying for those music lessons because <laughs> yeah. that gave me the discipline to get past. I think musicians are unusually well qualified to meditate. Musicians are also quite good at math. Uh, there's been not some, me, but they, <laughs> there have been some studies about that, though, because yeah. music is math. It's frequencies. It's the frequency spectrum. A440 and the octave above is is vibrating at 880. But you um, say musicians are particularly prime yeah. candidates for it because uh, because they know discipline uh, and they they know yeah. what practice means, right. and they also. Uh, when I went away to college, my dad said, son, there's only one lesson I want you to learn. And he said, I think you've already learned it partially, but you'll really learn it. It's called deferred gratification. Mm -hmm. And I went, what? Mm -hmm. And he said, deferred gratification. You're not going to use your degree until you're out in the world, more than likely. You're just going to go in some classes you'll light up like others you won't. <laughs> and and in my case, some I slept through. <laughs> right. But I managed to get through and, and got a degree in business and really didn't use it uh, until I was in the music industry. And thank goodness I had it. It allowed me to survive and read contracts and, and understand what lawyers were saying when it came time to huh. sign contracts. But anyway, that deferred gratification... Um, that comes through the discipline of doing something. And musicians, uh, we have that. If, if anyone has any kind of ac accomplishment, I'm not saying I'm a great keyboard player or pianist at all, but I had the discipline to continue. Yeah. Someone told me when I came to Hollywood, um, and I, I wish I could remember who it was because it was so true, but they said, you know, if you just stay around long enough, right. most people will leave <laughs> yeah. and you're left yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you will become successful. Yeah. You'll start having success uh, beyond what you imagined. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I really found that to be true. And and a lot of musicians do stay. Right. They stay. So a lot of actors leave. Yeah, yeah. Bill, Bill Clinton said uh, 90% of success is showing up. Right. There uh, you go. But there's the chain that connects. There's, there's another bridge, dis- discipline or dedication, right? And that leads to patience and perseverance and practice. Mm-hmm. It's all interconnected. Musicians have that. The other thing musicians seem to be susceptible to more than other people, though, on the, on the flip side, is anxiety and depression and uh, sometimes addictions. And why do you, from your perspective, why do you think that is? Hmm. I mean, in your case, you yeah. had stress. Right. All right. The, you have deadlines. And when the stress is based on your creativity, it's like creativity is so intangible that it's hard to deal with it mm-hmm. because, you know, you don't know where it's coming from, where your next note is going to come from. Well, I would like to quote from Dale Bozios, who's a, the great singer from Missing Persons yeah. and a good friend, Dale's mom. <laughs> Dale's mom, Hazel, may she rest in peace, told us once when we were out touring and we were on the East Coast and we had sold out, I think, 40 shows before we were signed. And Hazel said, always remember the higher you fly, the harder you fall. And how true that is when we get used to, uh, it's different reasons among different people. But I know uh, that I always thought about that. And Dale used to say that all the time. She'd say, remember, Chucky, mm-hmm. <laughs> the higher we go, the harder we fall. So we got to be, you know, not take it all so seriously. That's the that's a bad imitation of <laughs> Of Dale talking, but uh, I uh, think that's a great so saying. The yeah. higher, and I interpret that two ways: the higher you go in terms of esteem, acc- acclaim, money, and all that, and you get used to that high, mm-hmm. and then it, inevitably it stops. It stops for everybody, whether you're Michael Jackson, Prince, Elvis right. Presley, mm-hmm. Tom Petty, or Avicii, or whoever you are. Eventually, that stops. Although with Avicii's case, it, it, it hadn't yet stopped. But and then you, and then you fall because you're used to that high. But also creatively, when you're making music with a band or it's a high, exactly, and it's a high. And then you got to step into real life. And then and the reason it's a high is you know you you're transcending yourself. It's egoless, and you're totally harmonized, unified mind, which is what we strive for, right? Meditation mm-hmm. to have a unified. Well, you're unified in music. You have this high, and then you step into life, and boy, you fall. I think that's a great. I never thought about that in terms of yeah. your, the higher you go, the in terms of cre- its relationship to creativity as well. Yes, indeed, and, and that's a great. I think that's a great one. Uh, I can't really say the person's name, but he's a major, major producer with you know lots of number ones, and he said, you know, when I finish working on a project, I can't be left alone. He said, I am so bummed out, Hmm. you know, like the energy Mm -hmm. that goes. And that got me to thinking. And we talked about it a little bit. And I said, I got to thinking, you know, I said to myself, I need to find my energy from someplace else, someplace that's not dependent upon others. And uh, that was before I was meditating. Mm -hmm. But I, I just remember thinking to myself that, that if it's a gift I give myself through meditation, through a spiritual practice or whatever, if it's a gift I give myself, it's not going to be taken away as long as I'm conscious and in the world. And who knows after that? Nobody really knows. Nice. So I I just, I think about that. I use um, affirmations, you know. I can hear some people out there laughing and saying, <laughs> You know, an affirmation isn't reality. And I said, exactly. (laughs) If something isn't quite aligned in my own mind and my own spirit, I don't mind speaking out loud the way I would like it to be because it reminds me, you know, it's encouraging to me. Let's say, uh, I'll give you a very tangible example, was... um, I'm now writing classical piano music, and um, I had never done it before. I experimented a little bit, but I, I uh, 
This was in the mid 2000s. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to continue liquid mine. And um, I but I knew I wanted to to go back to piano, you know, from where I started, but I had no idea how to write. And I just kept telling myself over and over, I've written a piano sonata. I have everything it hmm. takes to write a piano sonata. Mm -hmm. And and what that does, and Michael Jackson used a lot of affirmations too. His yeah. favorite one was, I'm a magnet for miracles. Oh, nice. And he talked like that too. And some of that rubbed off on me, I'm sure. But as time went on, uh, I realized that saying an affirmation makes me aware of other opportunities around me. Um, that's beautiful. And and so I think that's a way to take what I learn in meditation about myself and help myself to make tangible changes. And uh, so... That's, that's lovely. So if you tell yourself, I'm a magnet for foolishness, is that an affirmation or sure. just a real... Uh... For me, that would be... <laughs> Uh, going to uh, maybe take lessons about being a comedian. <laughs> At the time, I, I took composition lessons from the wonderful Steve Rothstein, uh, who is a is a composition teacher. He was at UCLA. I think he still is, but one of the best teachers I've ever had in my entire life. Steve Rothstein, boy, if you have a chance to take a course from Steve, uh, go for it because it was worth every minute. And I ended up studying privately with him when I was still living in Hollywood. And um, anyway, it, it led to that. I learned a lot about orchestration from Steve, which has helped me in the Liquid Mind series. So what's your focus on now going forward or at the moment in terms of your music? Mm. Well, right now I'm recording my 16th album. Liquid Minds. Yes. Liquid mind. So really, that's the only focus. Okay. I definitely plan on doing more piano music. Um, I, I might do some other kinds of creative outlets. I'm just kind of thinking about it, uh, trying an idea on for size, as they say. Um, but uh, yeah. That's so if people want to buy, simple. what for instance, what stores would would have Liquid Minds? Um, uh, I don't even, I don't honestly know okay. because it's all streaming. Okay, the way so to support we, yeah. any musician these days is to go to Pandora, is to go to Apple Music, Amazon Prime, and, and Spotify. that's where they'll find Liquid Minds. Yes, and if they go to Pandora. What do they just put in? You just uh, type in Liquid Mind. Liquid I Mind. I don't have the the figure in front of me, my computer right. went to sleep, but yeah. there's something like 400,000 liquid mine stations or 300,000, no I can't remember. Wow. Uh, and they just, you know, that'll serve you liquid mind along with some other music. If you go to Spotify and put it in, you'll see there's a four hour long sleep playlist of liquid mind. There's, um, you know, you can just listen to different albums. And same thing with Apple Music and Amazon. You can just listen to that. So where do you make, get the most money from? Which which uh, which one of these platforms? I don't honestly know. I rather like uh, them all. Pandora was the first one, though, I will say. And Pandora pays through Sound Exchange. And for the musicians that are listening, if you're not signed up for Sound Exchange and you have music on Pandora... Don't let the day go out without signing up for Sound Exchange. In 2006, I was going to quit music. I was studying investing at UCLA at night school, which I've done in parallel for, right. that's a whole different story. But, um, And um, I started getting these tiny checks for like $6.00. Uh, every quarter, and then it was $24, then it was $100, then it was $200. And I thought, maybe I should find out what this sound exchange is. Right. I had signed up for it, but I didn't know. And it was started by uh, an act of Congress, I guess the Digital Millennium right. Copyright Act of 1998 uh, started it. And uh, they pay for internet radio, basically. 
So a lot of places. That's uh, Pandora. Is this is Pandora okay. pays the artist right through uh, Sound Exchange. Right. The other companies, and to some degree, Pandora for their rights owners share. Pandora pay, plays pays both rights owners and artists. So the rights owner share goes to the label, or in my case, I own part of it, the label owns part, uh, so we can share that. But uh, the other ones, there are these direct deal licenses. So all of your income may go through the label, but uh, it doesn't hurt to be signed up with Pandora uh, and to be signed up with Sound Exchange. Right. And it's hard to say who's who pays the most money. Okay. So um, you mentioned you have a website, liquidminds.com? Liquidmindmusic. Liquidmindmusic.com. Dot com. Yes. And all you have to do is Google Liquid Mind. Yeah. If you do happen to go to the Liquid Mind website, how many do I have now? There are four free MP3s representing about 20 or 30 minutes worth of music. If you're a veteran, click on the veterans link and there's a... a, a a zip file with 40 minutes of music for you to listen to uh, for free. I got, I suppose anybody could download right. that as well, but it, the intention is to help veterans since I'm a U.S. Navy veteran myself. So, right. Um, yep, that's. Yeah. But the best thing is just Google Liquid Mine. Okay. It's and do you want simple. do you want people to follow you on Twitter or Facebook or whatever? That's fine if they'd like to. Yeah. Uh, How do they find you? What what, what name? You just you? you just put in either Chuck Wild W I L D no E on the end or Liquid Mind, either one. Okay. And same thing. And if you uh, Google Chuck Wild, it comes up with Liquid Mind, and you'll see all the albums and and there's links to all the various streaming you know, everything, whatever they are, playlists and all that, on the Liquid Mind site, there's a very prominent button that says stream Liquid Mind 24-7. Cool. So did we cover everything you wanted to cover or that you think is worth covering? Oh, my gosh. Uh, I think so, Richard. Thank you for sending me, you know, some topics to give some thought to beforehand. I appreciate it. Well, that's... uh... Okay, well, it's been fantastic. Thank you, Chuck. You had some great stories. I can't wait to hear it again, to listen back what you said. But thank you, really, and um, great success with Liquid Mind 16. Well, thank you, Richard, and it's great to see you. All the best. Okay, that was a lot of fun speaking with veteran musician and friend Chuck Wilde. And now I'd really appreciate it if you took the time to leave the podcast a review and a rating. And please share it with your friends and anyone you think would benefit from listening to us. You can follow us at Wolf in Tune. And I want to take a moment just to thank the incredible intern, Christina Higa, and the incredible editor, Lonnie Ronaldo, and the incredible co-producer, Hannah Bowers. Now, until next time, I hope you can stay in a higher octave and let's stay in tune.